Hello everyone! Yes, it is me, it is Audi, and I am back! I have escaped Richard Ledbetter's dungeon, it was dark, it was dangerous, but I'm here to host another DF Direct Weekly, and luckily, very luckily, I am not alone, I am joined by my esteemed colleagues. I'm sure the word colleagues is kind of upsetting for Richard right now, but I'm here, of course, with the natural playboy himself, Alex Batalia. Oh, hey there, Audi. It's nice to see you alive and well. Um, yeah. Yes. It's good. Yeah, it's been many a comments asking where I am, and here I am. But of course, we're not alone, Alex. We are also joined by the man himself, John Lindman. Hey, dude. Yeah, we've been, uh, we've been hard at work on a special project over the last week, which I think we'll talk <laughs> about later today. But uh, if, we, if we seem a little bit tired, that might be why. <laughs> yes, a little bit disheveled. Uh, it is not just because of the torture I've been through. <laughs> it's also because of the other torture I've been through. With so, and I believe we are joined right now from location in Brighton. Is it? No. no. Oh. <laughs> Where do you live? Uh, I'm not going to disclose that publicly. <laughs> I actually I... have that information in my little handy book. I just so want I don't to, need to uh, ask you. I just want to say for the record, uh, your release from the dungeon, it was actually a prisoner exchange, so you've actually ended up in John's dungeon. <laughs> That's to right. Help him with the latest DF Retro. That's right. I believe c c he's working you harder than I ever did. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. We bit off a little I'm too a much. I'm a product of uh, the world, so I'm used to being punted around to whoever wants me. The answer is no one. Anyways, oh. it is indeed Richard Ledbetter. Thank you. Thank you for that remarkable introduction. It took a long time when we got there. Richard. This is actually the longest introduction the show has ever had. We'll see if we break the record next time. But we actually have a ton of things to discuss today. Well, you guys do. Mm -hmm. So let's jump into the first news item. Unreal Engine 5 is out. And I believe we already talked about this a little bit on the channel. Alex, I think you had a sit down with John uh, yesterday as of this recording. And uh, what's the scoop here about the new Unreal Engine? Uh, essentially, it's uh, moved into an early access uh, phase where you can download it. Anyone can actually download it now on PC to try out, compile projects. It comes with a couple um, testing uh, uh, projects like the, the Lumen and the Land of Nanite is not in there, but the, their second demo that they just showed off uh, on the UE5 stream, uh, like a 15 minute demo showing off the, the engine, uh, you can download that and try it out yourself. And it, uh, I've tested it out already on my PC. It's running really well. I still have to figure out how everything's working. Would like to return to it at some point in time, but it's just really interesting to finally get this into our hands now and actually see how it runs and ticks and performs. And uh, we did after John and I put out that video the other day where we're kind of working with uh, pre-release information, unfortunately, and you're not given all the information usually by the embargo. I'm starting to realize this now with a lot of this epic UE stuff. Uh, you don't get all the info until like it's already out. So John and I already worked at on that. And interestingly enough, uh, we initially reported in that video that uh, to that moment, Lumen was known as being a software ray tracing solution, but that's actually its quote unquote, like medium quality mode. Uh, it's high quality mode, which targets 1080p 30 FPS on next gen consoles according to their um, internal uh, documentation that they put on their wiki, actually does use hardware ray tracing. Um, it's very interesting how it actually works. Um, uh, it's essentially uh, for each like nanite mesh, it uses like a proxy model, kind of a little bit like how uh, proxy models are used in uh, uh, Spider-Man, uh, what is it? Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales for their uh, ray trace reflections. They use proxy uh, kind of geometry there which is very interesting. Um, so it does actually use hardware ray tracing. That's a correction for that video, but everything else said in the video is actually completely right. So don't worry about that, people in the audience. Um, I'm just super excited to actually see this out right now. I'm gonna be testing it in the next couple of weeks and hopefully get back to it. Likewise, yeah, it's uh, Unreal Engine is such a powerful tool and it continues to evolve. And I'm some of the demonstrations that have already popped up online really showcase what it can do. And I, I'm actually really impressed by uh, what is possible with Lumen right now. It really does seem more effective than I expected. Uh, I think one of the things I saw yesterday was like somebody just like put a little random object in the world and made it an emissive texture and the light was actually emissive and like impacting the, the overall light world lighting. Uh, 
and it looks really, really great in motion. I'd say like, it's, it's very impressive to see that all of the stuff is being calculated, uh, within, I guess, Lumen. So the only thing that's concerning is that, like you say, the, the 1080p 30 target for next gen kind of makes me wonder here. I mean, it looks incredible, but wow, that is a huge, uh, drop <laughs> in resolution and frame rate. <laughs> So there's two. Yeah, that's modes. for the uh, that's the hardware ray tracing. Yes. that's the hardware right. one. The the, the non-hardware one is uh, 60 FPS essentially at 1080p. Uh, okay, well that's interesting. I think uh, I've got like a question for you, Alex, which is essentially um, the demo that we saw. The new demo is very similar to the first one in that there's a lot of static geometry and uh, you know amazing vistas, but it's um, uh, kind of you know not very dynamic, sort of limited um, movement in the scenery. So, you know, is this highlighting an inherent limitation with the technology? I mean, you, I, I'm trying to imagine like a crisis jungle based around this and I can't see it. What, what do you reckon? It, it wouldn't work with it currently. Uh, so uh, you could do like the geometry of the terrain in that manner using Nanite, but the rest of the uh, geometry would have to be done through techniques we've seen you know, from games over the last 10 years, essentially. I, I think that makes sense, though. Like, I, I don't really see that as a big problem. To... Yeah, I, I, I don't see it either as well, other than, you know, uh, I guess I guess the only problem is that you have uh, conflicting art workflows at some point in time, where, where you have to, um, you're used to just like drag and dropping something into the engine, these massive uh, scanned objects usually, and then uh, for the other ones, you have to have like normal discrete LEDs, baking out normals, and all these things that, you know, it's just it's just a different uh, process. But in the end, uh, I think it is <clears throat> still a pretty big win. It's uh, another thing that probably would have to be investigated uh, is like, I would say, how big of a win is it visually uh, always? Because uh, honestly, I saw some also some other posts online where people are turning off Nanite and just showing like a normal imported in mesh that is done in the traditional way and then a Nanite version of that same mesh. And the difference at like a normal standard view distance was not actually uh, remarkable at all. It was actually pretty, you couldn't really see much of a difference at all. Uh, I think Nanite, um, it's gonna take some time for developers to kind of come up with really great use cases. Um, I mean, Alex, I think fundamentally yeah. it's all about shoving the camera right up in, in front of yeah, objects, right? as you do <laughs> in first person games all the time. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it kind of opens up, uh, opens the door for that extreme level of detail at close proximity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm really excited to see what some people do with it. I'm curious to see how they build on top of it because I was looking at uh, Twitter just this morning and Christoph, I forget his name, he used to work at uh, Flying Wild Hog doing their, uh, what was it called, Roadhog engine for a long time? Not Roadhog, Roadhogger. Yeah, I think it was called that. Um, and uh, uh, he worked on Lumen and he already said that the early access version of Lumen is missing some pretty large features that the later version has uh, that they have internally right now. So this is just going to be iterating over time uh, intensely. Uh, and I really, really look forward to seeing what's happening. And uh, just I do want to come back to that little topic of the actual performance target for next gen because it has changed a little bit. Um, you know, it was like 14, sub 1440p30 uh, last time. Now, uh, the two versions, you have like 1080p 60 target. They just call it target, by the way, of course. And then 1080p 30 target. The one thing there is I'm wondering if, if you know, if that's 1080p native rendering and then they apply their temporal upsampling to it, which is improved in Unreal Engine 5, I feel like it could still work out fairly well. I think it's uh, worth it definitely for some certain game types. Like uh, resolution isn't everything. And we're all about post-resolution era stuff here. I'm just curious about... Um, uh, this kind of, I still have to investigate the lower quality version of Lumen <clears throat> to see how it works. They recommend it only for kind of outdoor environments, uh, not indoor ones, interestingly. I'm presuming it's because it uses a lot more screen space information and will break more often in indoor ones, uh, but it may not work for all game types. So you still, like Unreal Engine 5 ha has these features, but you can also still use light maps. You can still use all these other techniques in Unreal Engine 5 with Nanite. Uh, Lumen is not necessary. So just because we're saying Unreal Engine 5 targets these things, that's with Lumen on. Uh, a normal game could still be targeting like a real 4K 60 uh, easily in yeah. Unreal Engine 5, I mean, just not using Fundamentally, Unreal Engine 5 is just going to continue what UE4 already offers and then adding all these new features on top of it. So 
I don't think that they would remove flexibility that they already have. Nah, not at so. all. It's just it's just like a, they have so many now different rendering pipelines yeah. depending upon what your game needs are. It's <laughs> it's cool though. Uh, we, it's it's, it's interesting. Really cool. Yeah, it's a lot of choices if you're building a new project. I'm interested. I mean, inevitably, this is going to end up in Fortnite, and I'm kind of curious to see a how that would look and b how it would integrate in this sort of multi-platform arena with systems that don't support. Uh, these systems. Fortnite's interesting because the way it's designed, it's a very outdoor terrain heavy kind of game. Uh, it seems mm -hmm. perfect for Nanite and Lumen. Uh, so I suspect yeah, it's, uh, we might see that. Maybe It's going to be interesting because like you can already cross-platform play like do all the things like play together like switch to PC. Is that cross-platform? Like wow. Wow. Okay. Well then you already have such extreme differences there. Um, it would just be another extreme difference between platforms. Uh, currently, right now, Lumen doesn't support uh, Xbox One or PS4. Pretty sure Nanite does, though, actually. Uh, uh, so it would just be a different lighting solution, and they would assume that, you know, that's not a huge competitive difference. That's actually an interesting point, though, Alex, is because that, you know, we're still in that cross-gen period, but I'd imagine by the time big U UE5 games start to ship, they will only target next-gen. But in the cases where, like, if Fortnite becomes a demo for Lumen and Nanite, you would assume only PC and next-generation consoles might have that feature. So if somebody were to try something similar in a cross-gen game, they'd still have to support traditional lighting models uh, to make it work, which, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, gets, it gets crazy. But either way, I mean... I'm excited to see what's, especially from a lot of the top Unreal Engine developers, like I, I expect uh, when the coalition finally shows their games, uh, it will probably blow everyone away since they've always been kind of the poster child for utilizing Unreal Engine at its best. So there's, uh, there's, there's so much interesting things that are going to be happening the next time. Uh, just from some impressions that I've already been gathering from online people compiling it, uh, there's two kind of things that people are like a little bit worried about with this. Uh, is that there's uh, kind of recommended specs and uh, also minimum specs for using Unreal Engine 5's editor, which is like 32 gigabytes of RAM minimum and 64 bit, uh, 64 gigs uh, as recommended. Uh, that is actually just for the editing environment. When you export the EXE, it doesn't require that at all. And I've already seen people with like 16 gigs of RAM running it completely fine on like RTX 2060s. So uh, it's not. Currently, right now, it's not exactly super heavy. It's only super heavy in the editing environment. Yeah. All right. Well, I think Unreal Engine 5 is going to color our conversations moving on, so I'm sure we'll be back to this topic. But uh, let's uh, jump on to the next news item. So next item, and I think we'll be back to you a little bit here, Alex, because yeah. <laughs> Crytek put out a tweet showing what seems like in-game graphics, or at least something mm -hmm. familiar to you. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, this is uh, essentially, I presume, Crytek is teasing the release of Crisis 2 Remastered. Uh, this doesn't come as a surprise to many people, I think, probably because there was this whole Crytek leak uh, earlier in the year, unfortunately for them, uh, that gave out that the fact that Crisis 2 Remastered was in the works at some point and probably Crisis 3 Remastered. Uh, well, weren't you at their office earlier this? <laughs> mm, I was at their office in September for sure. Yeah, yeah um, we, we yeah, were there seems, like a few months. Seems or, yeah. highly suspicious, Batalia. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, you just learn things, and sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this makes a lot of sometimes sense. Sometimes you uh, want to put them all over the internet. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just you know. Want to type Not that I'm pointing you. fingers, Alex. I'm sure you're entirely blameless for yeah. this entire situation. I've done nothing. I've done nothing. <laughs> I'll put a I'll Photoshop a copy of your NDA on screen right now, just to make sure we're legally covered. Yeah, yeah we're good. With a, with, a, with a kind of void stamp. <laughs> yes. Um, this and an makes... Alfred Chicken letter mark. <laughs> This this makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a trilogy of games that was stuck on last gen consoles. Uh, really great on PC, but you know last gen versions were pretty rough. Um, and you know it just makes a lot of sense to bring them up uh, into the kind of uh, new technology that's come around since then. Crisis Two was a game that for its time uh, was already made with a lot of like kind of pre PBR 
mentality. So it's going to scale up really well. I think people are going to be a little bit shocked about how good something like Crisis 2 Remastered can look. And uh, same for what I imagine is they're going to eventually tease Crisis 3 at some point. But I'm excited. Uh, I'll cover it for sure. Uh, give it its due. How about you, John? I mean, yeah, you know, we're going to we'll team up again and do just as we did last fall. I'll take the console versions. You take the PC provided that's where it arrives. And uh, yeah, because I'm I'm excited because I, I really hope this happens because I like Crisis 2 and 3. Uh, I know Rich especially loves Crisis 3, though. Yeah, and I'm kind of, uh, I do like Crisis 2. I mean, um, I'm quite looking forward to that. I think there's something we do need to stress, which is that Crisis 1 was derived from the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 versions. And there have been some profound issues with that as the, you know, what you could call uh, legacy debt um, on a technological perspective. But Crisis 2, uh, that was multi-core aware right from the off, ran really well back in the day. They've got a good PC version to base the uh, the remasters off. That's you know a really good foundation point. So I hope I'm not sort of jinxing it, but the omens look good for this one, right? Because um, you know basically we've got an engine that's kind of more um, adept at multi-core processing, which was the big issue with that Crisis One remaster, where they just couldn't rid themselves of the of the single-threaded nature of the original engine. Yeah, that, that was a shame. Um, who knows what will happen there in the future. But Crisis 2 is an amazing starting point. Crisis 3 is an even more amazing starting point. That, that scales incredibly well on multi-core CPUs. Uh, another really cool thing about these games that I mentioned, since they're like, they were made in like a kind of pre-PBR mentality, so physically-based rendering, is that plugging in the ray tracing or the, the voxel uh, global illumination that CryEngine has into these titles uh, should be rather seamless in terms of how it interacts with the art style of these games. Are you uh, talking so that about interesting. Sfogy. Sfogy. <laughs> That good old Sfogy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that works because, you know, uh, I, as much as I critiqued Crisis 2 in one video, not even two years ago now, longer now, actually, you know, two years ago now, um, uh, it does have a very special place in my heart, mm -hmm. if not for breaking it, but also for, you know for just kind of coming out. And uh, I'm I'm excited to see what they bring out. Yeah, cool. Very cool. Yeah, I look forward to seeing your coverage on this. You always educate me so much when you do <laughs> these videos, Alex. So Thanks. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's move on to the next news topic. Let's go into some uncharted territory. <laughs> Got it, Rich? Did that do good? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm right? kind of picturing a kind of uh, Doc, Doctor Evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pun. Right? Yeah, it was awesome. Well done. <laughs> yes. Sir. So uh, I'm very proud of that segue. Uh, Uncharted 4 coming to PC. We wanted to talk a little bit about it. And we even got some questions regarding this. And Rich, uh, what's the scoop here about Uncharted 4? It's an interesting one. Basically, we know that Sony are bringing out a bunch of their uh, existing PlayStation 4 exclusives to PC. Uh, we've already had Horizon Zero Dawn, Days Gone. Uh, I was kind of expecting to hear word of God of War next, but on this investor presentation of all areas, uh, it was uh, revealed that Uncharted 4 from Naughty Dog looks like it's going to be uh, uh, coming out to PC. I'm really excited by this because... Um, well, what can I say? It's a brilliant game, but there are certain limitations. I guess principally the 30 frames per second cap is uh, something where um, the game could truly benefit from an upgrade. And um, I guess also on PS4 Pro, um, resolution only ever scaled to 1440p, so there's chances to uh, get a bit more clarity on the visuals there. So, yeah, really excited by this and just generally... I'm just really excited by Sony's move into the PC space, even if it's not like day one, day and date, uh, as Microsoft is doing. I think they realize that they've got nothing to lose and everything to gain by actually expanding well, the reach of these games. It's kind of funny though, Rich. Uh, based on the topic we'll discuss later regarding the project that Audi and I are doing, Sony was into, they released a lot of first party stuff on the PC during the 90s. So... They they used to be a PC developer as well, and then kind of stepped back. So it's really interesting. Yeah, was it Sony entire... Image Soft? No, 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 no. Yeah, well, that was before. Yeah. Once the PlayStation yeah. launched, a lot of their big titles ended up on the PC as well. I mean, they had like, right. the, you know, Twisted Metal was there. You know, their ESPN launch game was there, and a whole bunch of others. Like they were just, you know, bringing them straight over. 
yeah, I think the separation of markets back then was much stronger. That's I think true. The overlap now between console and you know PC is so much it's different. More narrow. Yeah. So um, I think sales kind of are affected. Whereas back then, I think you know they had like one sale, and that was you. Because you're the only one who owns like the big box version of like most of these yeah. old PlayStation games. <laughs> that's that's quite a comment there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also um, guarded about it because um, you know with Days Gone there was the opportunity to tap into existing Unreal Engine four technologies. You know it was a UE four game, so you know there were some uh, I won't call them easy wins, but they you know easily available technologies that could be reintegrated into the code base that wouldn't require a huge amount of R&D. Whereas with the Uncharted 4 and indeed Horizon Zero, 4, Horizon Zero Dawn before it, uh, essentially these games were tailored explicitly for PlayStation hardware. And I'm not sure of the scalability implications beyond that. I don't know what you think about that, Alex. Uh, scaling up, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to, we, we've never seen this engine uh, at all on anything but PlayStation consoles. Uh, I, I mean, it's really hard to guess because I could have guessed maybe before that Horizon Zero Dawn was going to come out just fine, and it didn't. Based on the fact that you know uh, another Decima game, Death Stranding, was fine. Yeah. So like uh, at that point in time, I, I came off a little bit surprised after that. Um, I, I hope it runs really well. I mean, they've they've already shown that The Last of Us Part Two, at least on a similar built engine, an iteration of that same engine can scale to 60 FPS rather fine. Uh, you know, maybe it has some issues that are there, but they're not wholly visible or a big deal. Um, so I'd hope the same is for PC. I just maybe be a bit worried about how it runs on anything but AMD hardware, uh, as weird as that sounds, uh, but because, you know, this game's kind of been tailored around working really fine on a PlayStation 4's, you know, GPU, which is like AMD GCN, and it's using a lot of async compute. And if they don't translate all of that over to the PC space with like a DirectX 12 port uh, or a Vulkan port, uh, uh, then, then we could see some really weird performance scaling. Uh, so I hope it is, if it does come out, uh, it is a, I do hope it's like a DirectX 12 port or, or Vulkan port. If this port happens, I want to see Rich tested on his uh, Jaguar equipped uh, PC, <laughs> just to see how how that bad boy runs. That would Jeez. be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Right. Well, I could give that a go. I mean, we <laughs> do have a question here from Anton Kirilenko uh, regarding this news. In the light of the news about Uncharted Four coming to PC, do you think it will come out before a PlayStation Five patch? Would be interesting, he says, to see sixty frames per second in Uncharted Four on PC before PlayStation Five. Uh, this is a bit of a uh, how could I describe it? Uh, a bit of a rabbit hole we might disappear down here. Uh, because um, obviously we have seen an old PlayStation 4 game receive a PlayStation 5 patch in the form of Ratchet and Clank. Um, but I think, it, you know, from what we're hearing, it was kind of almost, um, how can we describe it? Uh, it was a very difficult situation, kind of fortunate that it happened at all. And Uncharted 4 is a game that's, um, you know, running on an older SDK. It doesn't have the system call available that would uh, tell the code whether it's running on PlayStation 5. I don't think it's impossible. Um, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see Uncharted 4 at 60 frames per second. I don't think it's a hardware limitation or anything like that, obviously, because, you know, we've seen The Last of Us Part 2. Um, but at the same time, it's more of a logistical issue in terms of SDKs and stuff. It kind of depends on what Naughty Dog still has available for this, uh, because fundamentally they need to update the software itself, um, which is why this differs so much from like the FPS boost stuff, where uh, the game developers don't need to do anything. It's all handled at the system level, which is great for situations with older games like this, uh, where here it's like, like you say, um, it's hard. The only, the only hope I guess there is, is that because they did kind of keep updating this for the PS4 pro launch, maybe they kept an active bill. I don't know. We'll have to see. Mm. Yeah. I do think it would require, despite what happened with Ratchet, it would require moving on to a new SDK unless there's, you know, they've got the ability to access a really old development kit or to, you know, or to remount that project. It's really, uh, 
a logistical issue, really. I'm, I'll be interested to see if it happens, but uh, I'm not holding out hope. But, you know, I we'll, guess we'll wait and see. It would be kind of bizarre to have The Last of Us Part Two on pre- PlayStation 5 patched first and then going back to a, a much older game. But, you know, wouldn't rule it out completely. All right. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk more about this as more games are announced and as the game comes out. But uh, let's uh, move on to the next topic. Next on the docket, it is a leak, another leak. Vitalia, you've been busy. Ah. Uh, it is uh, from Ars Technica. We're seeing that Steam, or Valve rather, is releasing perhaps something called the Steam PAL, which I can only assume converts all your games to the PAL format in 150 hertz, right? With lots of books. So uh, this will be very useful for most German consumers, I assume. Uh, but no, this uh, promises to be, uh, if the leaks are correct, kind of like a Switch portable, like an NVIDIA Shield situation, I guess, with um, being able to play your PC games portable. Uh, Rich, what's your take on this? Uh, I'd say I'm really excited by this because there is this um, kind of growing trend of portable PCs that are coming about that are kind of like Switch-like in form factor. And there is something really attractive about being able to play your PC games on the go, just like just like the Switch. Um, the problems that I can foresee, first of all, there's this whole concept of uh, the fact it's running on Linux, which means that there's going to be quite a limited um, array of titles. Um, but on the flip side, what that does mean is that maybe they'll have been optimized for this platform, which leads me on to my second concern, which is power budgets. Um, just, you know, the Switch has got something like a 10 watt power envelope in, in portable mode. And um, to get that kind of performance from a PC part, to get meaningful performance from a PC part in that kind of power budget, either you're going to have to have a much bigger battery uh, to maintain battery life, or I don't know, you know, or maybe it's just not going to be, it's going to be kind of low power games. I don't know. What do you think about this, Alex? Um, I, I'm looking at this right now and... Um... I, for me, it's. Uh, I do always when I'm looking at these kind of topics. I do wonder what kind of hardware it is using. Uh, you, you were, you know, if it's not going to have something like DLSS, which I presume the next uh, switch will end up having at this point. I feel like it's coming into a market at a position that is uh, less technologically interesting. But going back to your uh, comment about uh, Steam on Linux, it is going to have more limited titles. There is the ability to use their um, kind of DirectX to OpenGL or DirectX to Vulkan translation layer that they have available for Linux clients. It will mean, though, uh, sacrificing some GPU and CPU performance to do that. Uh, and if we're already talking about a low-powered portable device, uh, then, you know, that makes it less tenable, uh, unless you're going for like lower resolutions and lower settings and things like that. Uh, but uh, I haven't spent too much time reading up about this, and I probably need to spend more time. Do we know if it has a dock? Like, I think it's it does dock mention in? that they, there is a dock via USB-C, perhaps. Okay, then, uh, well, it, it could be anything at that point. Yeah, I, I guess it could be anything at that point. Uh, I, I don't know. I think we do. I, I personally need a little bit more information on it. I don't ever play video games on the go. I'm just not someone who does that kind of thing. <clears throat> but I really do like the idea of having your entire Steam backlog, even if it's partially, you know, slower and with like a worse frame rate on the go. That's probably going to appeal to a lot of people. I think the problem is I have. I mean, the the uh, the story here talks about uh, the existing products, and they are out there. You know, GPD have done one. There's the new AO1, which looks really interesting, but also looks really large. Uh, so I don't really have any experience of um, using these uh, these existing devices, which might change my opinion somewhat. Um, but, you, you know, it is the fact, there is the fact that um, AMD and Intel have got some really good performing low power parts, but I'm not sure that you're going to be getting a really good experience from them. Or if you are, it could just be really old games. I mean, GTA 5 is always wheeled out. That is actually a kind of quite a light game, uh, relatively speaking. And um, its demands at 30 frames per second are actually fairly low, judged by today's standards. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's going to be terrible, but I, I kind of want to get, go hands on with one of these devices to see what's actually possible. And, and also just to see how the battery life holds up, because this kind of concept of power consumption, I mean, it's why the Switch runs with, I mean, when we published the clocks for the Switch, everybody lost it. They couldn't believe how slow 
Nintendo was running the Tegra X1. It's all for battery life because that's what's demanded. And that's the thing, though, is like on the Switch, at least, the games are designed and customized around these slower clocks. Uh, But PC games are not necessarily built for this kind of hardware. I mean, there is definitely scalability in most titles, but I don't know if they'll... We'll have to see how well they can scale down to, to a machine like this. But what I will say is on the flip side, there is hardware out there which is coming from the other direction where it starts on mobile and scales up. So while I'm not entirely sure what's going to go on with the Steam Power, I think the stuff that Apple is doing with the M1 chip is absolutely fascinating. We saw those benchmarks um, with some emulation. I think it was with Dolphin and the results were superb. Yeah, I mean, this is all stuff that is running in a mobile form factor on a, on a laptop and indeed the new iPads. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going to be really interesting to really interested to see how all of this uh, sort of works out. And I am keeping an eye on the whole Apple situation. I just think at this point they've got the hardware. It's, it's just basically whether they care enough about games to actually go <laughs> for it and actually produce a really good gaming platform. Well, uh, I think for that, they need to actually really support Vulcan in a native sense. Uh, then, they, then they would probably interest way, way many uh, more developers because you may already have Vulcan code lying around instead of having to do like a translation layer again. Uh, so, but yeah. Well, Apple is always kind of like the huge opportunity, right? Because, you know, they've got this huge installed base with phones. Um, they pretty much own the tablet space these days with iPad. Nobody else really seems to put much effort into tablets these days. And of course, um, we've got the, the sort of higher end stuff happening on the Mac where you know, there's a huge amount of um, positivity surrounding the MacBooks and, uh, and the M1 silicon in general. So it's there for the taking, really. Um, I'm just kind of waiting for something to happen <laughs> beyond Apple Arcade. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of tweets saying that they use the Surface now that you mentioned that about tablets, Rich. Yeah. Well, it's not a you know it's not a huge market, is it the the surface market? Probably not. But they're very passionate. <laughs> <laughs> now with the uh, Valve stuff, uh, whenever they release stuff related to Steam, uh, I always think the idea is really cool, and it comes out, and then it kind of just fizzles away. Like the idea is there, potential is there, but it never really reaches anything where I think it's like you, on a grand scale usable. So it's kind of like the Google situation, right? Where it's like the core product is fine, but then the support for it just doesn't exist after a while. I guess what's kind of uh, interesting to me is also that the whole Steam machines concept, the whole Steam on Linux thing, was this huge hedge bet against um, Microsoft ruining the PC ecosystem with uh, Windows 8 and subsequently Windows 10, which hasn't really happened, you know? That's kind of the reason why the Steam machines didn't really gain much traction, but this looks like another approach uh, with Linux. What about the Subor Z? What what was that about? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, that was essentially a console um, with Windows running on it. And um, they were going to produce their own OS layer for it, Um, but it never happened. Uh, And I do still have that machine. Maybe we'll take a look at it at some point in more depth. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of curious to see what's going to happen with Steam and Linux and Steam Power. Could be pretty cool. Uh, again, I think there's going to be the, the whole question of just software. It needs a, a really good reason to exist. It always comes down to software. I'm sure it will be specific cases where, wow, this is really cool. And like, you know, when Rich t- t- tests it out, I'm sure there's some results that are going to be really surprising. And then that's the last time we heard of it. <laughs> so let's move on one more last news items today one that's really exciting for mm. me and i'm sure very exciting for mr lindman here is the return of virtua fighter finally I've, this has been rumored for a long time i've heard some rumblings here and there of what it was going to be from certain people but what it is john is a return of five yeah, specifically, it's Virtua Fighter 5, um, and it's been sort of ported over to the Dragon Engine, it sounds like. Uh, so they called it Ultimate Showdown, and it's a remaster of Final Showdown. Uh, and Virtu- this is really interesting, though, that they're still bringing... Like, Virtua Fighter 5 has kind of not aged a day, I would say. It still looks great. It plays brilliantly. But, I mean, I first played this game back in, like, 2005 during the location test in Tokyo. And 
to 2005 to now it's a it's been around a while but uh so you know i had kind of hoped to see like a new brand new installment but this is kind of like the second best thing we could ask for i guess mm-hmm. when it comes to virtua fighter it's been so long now that anything yeah exactly is a good anything you know unless it's pachinko <laughs> then i wouldn't be too happy uh, but uh yeah i'm really happy to see just what's going into this dope because it's not just like a port over to uh, i think it's a digital only ps4 at the moment yeah i think it's fairly limited Which, unfortunately but still. yeah i'm not sure what's going on there but anyway i mean it's coming out uh, digitally and uh, actually they brought back a good portion of the am2 team the original arcade team is back to oversee the changes from the yakuza team who are assisting them so there's going to be a lot of back-end changes to this. And one of the more interesting ones also is the fact that they are redoing the music, which um, now every stage is going to have like brand new uh, stage music and things like this. So they're putting a lot of work into this. Uh, graphically, it's going to have a pretty big boost as well. And there was some hints, at least on Twitter, I saw that uh, there might be like guest characters because that's all the rage right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would make um, that would make some sense. I guess the weirdest yeah. thing for me is that apparently this trailer was hosted exclusively on IGN and the trailer itself is only 30 frames per second. And I feel like that's somehow sacrilegious to release a new Virtua Fighter, a new Virtua Fighter trailer at 30 FPS. Uh, it doesn't really show off what the game is all about there. So it's actually a remaster, right? It's not just going to be another mm-hmm. port. They have actually improved. Yeah, it. that's yeah, yeah, what I understand. Know, yeah. Pretty much every aspect of the game will be uh, touched up. So okay. uh, rebalancing and everything. Do we know if they're going to redo any of the net code to be like more modern style? Uh, I forget always oh, the name. Rollback. Code? Rollback. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe it's going to have rollback code. No. Oh. So and this is, uh, I mean, that could be its own episode. Yeah. I actually don't play. I play fighting games pretty much every day. Yeah. Uh, when I do play games. So, but I don't play them online much no. just because I don't like. Uh, I don't enjoy that experience too much. Mm-hmm. I like, you know. If I'm going to beat up people, they have to physically be there. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I don't really person, but I know it's a huge deal for people. So mm-hmm. hopefully the net code uh, is serviceable. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's we'll always the thing with fighting games. They come out and they're uh, almost every time it's mm-hmm. like the net code sucks. Just like to say, I, I really did enjoy your no <laughs> there, Alex. <laughs> well, I just I, had I, sudden flashbacks to uh, Revenge of the Sith. Uh, I have uh, the, the oh emergency no. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've had uh, I when I've played fighting games, I've actually have played them online because I don't have someone to play them here with me, and I and I you know uh, the games I was really interested in didn't have really great uh, single player online components like Killer Instinct. Uh, uh, or offline components. I mean, like Killer Instinct 2013. That was really had really excellent net play, and I spent a lot of time on that. Uh, so uh, it is a shame, though, when I think when a game doesn't get that right. But it, it could still be picked up in the in the tournament scene. Obviously, still, uh, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, I mean, Virtua Fighter uh, is a game that very much lives on the fighting game community and the tournament scene. So it's uh, this announcement and everything about bringing it back is very much for that community mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that kind of showcasing. So I can kind of see why they went with five rather than making a brand new one. Yeah. Because from ground up for me uh, as a fighting game fan, I think it's a little bit weird because 3d fighting games have kind of lacked an impact for a while now. I mean, we've had Tekken seven, which was we've good. had that are live six. Um, I think Tekken but, seven has sold really, really well though. Has it? it? It's not bad. Don't get me wrong, but it's still just kind of it's a, the ultimate Tekken, sure. But uh, you know, we've seen such a renaissance with two D fighting games for years now, and continue to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even like things like Street Fighter Five and uh, any eventual sequel is going to be you know fundamentally in two D, even though it's three D graphics. Mm-hmm. But a full like three D, I think it's time we bring back Toshinden. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh my god. How could you? <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Um, <laughs> I'm um, uh, I'm kind of sort of bemused by Sega, really, because um, there doesn't appear to have been much attempt to kind of leverage the uh, the Model One, Model Two, Model Three library. You know, these there there were some amazing games there, and um, just you know, straight high resolution ports. You know, stuff like Scud Race, Super GT, or whatever. Um, Virtua Fighter, 
Um, I'd love to just have a pack of all of the Virtua Fighter games. Seems like a no no brainer to me. Why has it happened? Well, it has happened. Uh, I mean, 360 had like the Virtua Fighter 2 port back in the day, and Sonic the Fighters uh, on PlayStation yeah, 2. We had like the. Uh, well, that was kind of like a reskin, actually, that uh, Virtua Fighter game there. The mm -hmm. the, there's a few like that have happened, before. but specifically with Model 3. I feel like yeah, that's a hard one. There's though. almost none of that out there, and that's mm -hmm. the stuff that really holds up well. And you just yeah. don't, you just don't see it, and it's a shame. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's well, the emulation yeah, that's... for that, even though. Oh, oh it's, it's pretty good, isn't it's it? It's fine. I mean, okay. you know, the work that's been done and the games run really well. So, I don't think it would be difficult to pull it off. Mm. Necessarily, I mean, it would require some, definitely some work, but it's completely feasible. And you know you got you got talent out there like M2 who've just done some amazing work, um, so you know I really want to see that. I mean the funny thing is is that I kind of um, moved away from covering Sega, uh, kind of from VF4 onwards. So I've, my heart is with the older Virtua Fighters, even Virtua Fighter One. Uh, you know Virtua Fighter One, Two, and Three. Those are the titles that you know have the biggest sort of emotional resonance with me that I'd really like to see. And um, I just don't, couldn't really connect with VF4, VF5. So, yeah, again, I'd just really like to see those older titles examined and, and remastered. And, yeah, just the whole kind of um, Model 2, Model 3 era just seems to be like a lot of un, unmined potential there. But, you know, I guess VF5, I, I, I will check it out because uh, I'm a... A fan of the series. Maybe we can do a quick video on that at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe uh, even I could join in a exactly. video. And I think um, <laughs> someone noted that a Virtue Fighter 5's uh, Xbox 360 version is compatible uh, with uh, Xbox One and Series X slash S. So that's really nice. And also, there is a limited version of Virtue Fighter buried within specific Yakuza games. Yeah, right? People have already kind of uh, torn that out and got its own like menu working. I know. Uh, I think Silent is working on that right now. Silent from like the Silent patches. Yeah, but, yeah. There's also Sega has been doing those the mini consoles. There was the Astro City cabinet that came out recently, so we might see some love for the model. It always feels like they console. always get, they never get far enough along to actually tackle Model Three. It's like, well, let's start back over with the Mega Drive every time. <laughs> They yeah, keep doing that. They work their way up, and sometimes you get all the way to Model 2, oh, and then it's like, yeah. oh, okay, well, we're abandoning that. And then the next time they do it, they start back at uh, Mega Drive. I remember when the Daytona USA remaster came out on um, the PS3 and whatnot, and there was always the talks there of like redoing Daytona 2. And for years, that rumors was going on. I believe even development did start uh, on doing something like that, and then it was just kiboshed. So, yeah, it, there's always, like, a curse regarding... It's like Saturn. It's like, you know, you have all these Genesis compilations and whatnot, and people keep demanding Saturn, 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 and we never quite get there. We get, like, a Saturn mode in Nights on PS2. That's about as close. Well, I'll tell you what, Woody, there's still a big mystery about the Saturn version of Virtua Fighter 3, which John oh, and I yeah. regularly return to and discuss. Mm -hmm. And um, I even asked you, Suzuki, personally about it yeah and it didn't get much unfortunately <laughs> no he, uh, so, so oh, maybe yeah. you can tap into your japanese sources to get find out what happened there because i'm personally of the belief that maybe there was like an initial tech demo but there was never anything on it that suggests that it definitely was that there were two versions and then they basically just shelved it when dreamcast was coming along i know that you know suzuki has been saying for a long time now after shenmue he wants to uh, jump back into the fighting game genre so could be that we're looking into something much bigger down the line here we'll have to ask him next time we meet him john mm. every time we meet suzuki we always ask him very annoying questions and he <laughs> just kind of discard them and want us to focus on the big stuff so, like our shenmue meeting oh yes that one <laughs> uh, maybe we'll do a video on that one day how we pissed off you suzuki hey, that was not our <laughs> that was not our fault <laughs> <laughs> that's true that is true Anyways, uh, I think that actually kind of wraps up the news for today uh, and uh, lots of exciting stuff. We'll get back to a lot of this, I'm sure, in the future, but let's uh, jump on over to DF content of this week.
All right, so DF content of the week. This is the part where we talk about what's uh, been on the channel and what's coming on the channel, as well as our Patreon. And let's start off with our Patreon this week because there's something very big coming on this coming Sunday. John? Uh, well, we took, we, we took the ambitious uh, goal of trying to do a launch-focused episode where the idea was, hey, we're going to look at a, a co old console launch cut and cover every single game in all the main regions. And uh, we kind of debated back and forth and ended up doing the original PlayStation because that period of time is fascinating and results in comparisons with both 16-bit machines and the other competing 32-bit machines and the 64-bit machine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and... Uh, it is exactly as interesting as we had hoped. And there, there was a lot to talk about here, but it was also, I think we, we, uh, underestim underestimated the scale and scope of the project because right now, and I don't know how long it's going to end up being in the end, but it's, it's, it's about two hours currently. It's probably going to be more than that. And, uh, it's the most absurd project I think we've ever worked on. <laughs> I don't think this will be the norm moving forward no. of doing two hours plus. Uh, but uh, as you said, it was a topic we t picked because this is our first co-production since, you know, the Patreon relaunch, me joining mm -hmm. up uh, to mm -hmm. do these things. So we kind of wanted to kind of go big, push the limits a little bit and see how far can this go on, you know, its biggest scale and two hours probably is the biggest uh, unless we get the Tim Rogers to join us. And like, it's so many comparisons. There's so many overlaps, you know, because this is, even though it's the introduction of 32-bit, we're so still ingrained in 16-bit by the time the PlayStation's there. So you have the other CD consoles that, or cartridge consoles that claim to do higher, and uh, they certainly don't. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, interesting points of comparison for this. But yeah, the PlayStation launch, what's interesting about it too is just the background of it. All regions are very different. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. So, you know, Japan, fairly traditional, but also very um, lacking, I think, generally. Just kind of like it has a few points of like interest, like Ridge Racer and um some other games we talk about but uh, generally it's mahjong <laughs> and uh like uh, the u.s launch very 3d heavy uh, no it's not, that, it's not that 3d heavy though there was a, there's four Compared to four the 2d games <laughs> but mahjong yeah. you know i don't know the focus on uh, my my point is more on the focus yeah and, like you have they the focus Tracer, on you have the air combat and the uh, you know whereas yeah, the Raiden project and said, no one, no one, no one knew about Raiden project, man. It's good <laughs> it though. It just came out. It was not a show. So, the, I guess the big thing here though is it was really fun. Like for some of these games, there's a lot of versions. Like for NBA Jam Tournament Edition, we actually captured all ten versions. Every version. Uh, and for like, even for like the Japanese launch, we did the most absurd comparison I think we've ever done where yep. we actually compared five versions of a mahjong game running on playstation yep. saturn pcfx super famicom and the 3do uh why i don't know but that that's <laughs> in there very fascinating <laughs> very interesting the weirdest thing yeah. for me though and i don't want to spoil which ones are why but hmm. there's a lot of playstation versus saturn in this episode and yep. like nine times out of ten the saturn version is better it's, wow uh, yeah i but uh, <laughs> in some cases though i think at least the sound version came out a little bit later the, okay that's 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 the fair truth though a lot of the saturn versions came out like six months after the playstation version so they maybe had a little more time um but still it's not you wouldn't necessarily have expected that given the way the market went but saturn was really strong at first with a lot of these types of games it's just over time I think PlayStation developers improved dramatically while the Saturn development never really got to be that easy. Yeah, it's been very interesting to me to just do the research here and look into the actual launch, uh, the ad campaigns, uh, all these kind of different background aspects, not just the games, because we actually go into kind of how Sony presented the console compared to its competitors. And it was very different. It was very... In every region. Uh, line yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was... Japan, uh, you know, Sony wasn't necessarily known for 
amazing products, I'd say. They were kind of like a fine hi-fi sound. Producer. They were mid to upper tier. Like, they weren't quite yeah. like the high end, but they were above like the average for sure. Like, you know, yeah, they were one very... of those Trinitrons. Yeah, and it's clear from just when you see comments from other people in Sega and Nintendo and whatnot, they did not expect Sony to have any impact. You know, they totally disregarded it and said, like, well, Sony doesn't know video games and they just make hi-fi products and you know, electronics and they aren't even that good. <laughs> in some cases, they, like, straight out say it. So it's it's interesting to see how, um, how all the other console providers were caught on, you know, completely pulled the rug under their feet on this because they really weren't ready and that's clear when you look at just what they had in response the first year of the playstation's life cycle it was just they weren't namco went really big on the playstation as well and that almost kind of just goes back to nintendo kind of screwing namco over back in the famicom days that was a, a pretty famous incident um and I feel like they, it took a long time for the Nintendo Namco relationship to kind of recover from that, but they were very ready, clearly, to go partner with someone else, and that's exactly what they did. I mean, they tried several times. They did Tengen on Nintendo. They did like Pac-Man, and whatnot, on the black cartridges, uh -huh. uh, and then famously with Sega, uh, they had a deal there, and then finally in the PlayStation, it kind of worked out. They, Namco was such a game center aligned company that was hard for them i think the transition to console for them was hard uh for those games because they were always so ahead of time that when the playstation came out that was the first time they had hardware to kind of fully represent the arcade experience definitely go check it out it'll come out this weekend i think for the patrons and then i think when we bring it out for everyone else we'll probably do it sort of in parts because of the insane three length. parts maybe and then maybe at the <laughs> end we'll eventually put the full thing live together you know just to keep it all organized but We'd probably break it up by region, maybe something just to make it a little bit more palatable for, for the audience, because not everybody wants to sit down and watch a two and a half hour video. No, that I mean, that is the ultimate question when you do something this big is that like it's impressive, it's fun. But uh, for a YouTube audience, um, two hours is probably an impossible ask 90 percent of the time. Yeah, it's just impulse wise it just you're not going to sit in front of your monitor and statically watch one thing for that long um, just look so at it like this it's like a whole bunch of episodes of uh df retro basically which by the way as of like this as of this week it's uh like five years old now that's congrats so yeah nice. yes. so yeah so yeah go check so it yeah, out it's actually an anniversary year, right i didn't even realize that until he told me uh, but yeah so so tell me, so tell me, John, um, when you get to the European launch, September 1995, do you run the games in PAL mode? So what we're planning, this is the part where we have to work on next, really, is um, I'm planning to do a, an introduction to say, like, hey, we have to talk about PAL. And then we're going to start by showcasing games that were shared between the US and European launch. Basically, like, here's Ridge Racer. This is how it worked in PAL territories. And kind of educate people, again, on what was lacking but for the actual games coverage itself i kind of wanted to just stick with the 60 hertz versions for the main coverage because 50 hertz on a 60 hertz display and running slow and all this it's not as pleasant to watch so i don't want to subject people to this originally i think we had the idea of just doing you know well this is a pal game so it's 50 hertz but it's just as john said so we'll, we'll just do the comparisons uh, off the top and then move into the 60 frames. you know the, the japanese games were, were huge you know ridge racer principally and then you know after months of playing it at 60 hertz uh, on our import consoles you know ridge racer on ps1 pow it's just so disappointing it was ah oh, yeah, let's just not go there <laughs> no, and the PlayStation was one of the consoles where it was kind of, uh, at the time, completely impossible to mod or anything to get 60, uh, 60 hertz oh, yeah. support because uh, it was locked into the um, the software itself. So, like, you couldn't just get, like, on the Saturn, for example, you could have a switch. Yep. You can do, like, a light switch mod, and you would have 60 uh, hertz. On um, many games, But on yeah. PlayStation, you didn't have this option mm -hmm. for the longest time, and I don't think there's, you know, and now you just mod the consoles to run. The actual yeah i don't think there's topic. really a good way to fix pal games at all no. you just have to play the nts ntsc versions yeah 
and uh, it, it was a brutal time especially when you go back and look mm -hmm. the the pal, the pal conversions were bad yeah like, they were there was a few companies that like like rare i remember if they put out Donkey Kong country they actually appropriated the uh, game speed proper they did they converted so i think it used a full pal like signal full screen yeah rare did that a lot uh, with their 64 titles yes. but yeah and to be fair sega did you know all of the major sega games at the time got full power conversions but you know that does mean that your 30 fps game like virtual cop would run at 25 frames per second there's just no way out of this this horrendous power nightmare unless you had a 60 hertz capable machine or a switchable satin I mean, you probably just had the uh, actual Japanese consoles, Rich. Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. But we did actually move to switchable because, you know, it's just the way forward, really. So, yeah. So it's been a very interesting process making this episode. Uh, you know, we def definitely tested our limits on uh, just the scheduling and the workload. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've been... Man, last week I was editing like two videos, capturing and everything at the same time. It was a crazy, uh, crazy week. And then this week we just from morning to night. Yep. You know, as soon as I get up, I get my breakfast and I get my John. And so it's <laughs> my day every day. Just uh, to right. hook up and uh, yep. talk about what's next for today. You hook up with John for breakfast. That sounds yes, good. I hook yeah. up with John, yep. with John yep. for breakfast. And then we spend all day long. Okay. But we weren't the only ones doing behind the scenes kind of work. Uh, we should also let Rich talk about uh, something you did this week, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, I just really like the idea of turning on the camera, uh, recording the oh, desktop no. and just talking, <laughs> talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anytime, <laughs> anything, anywhere, just turn on the camera. Here, here it comes. <laughs> anyway, with regards to the Patreon side of things. Um, yeah, essentially, I just finished the RTX 3080 mobile um, uh, review. And um, it's just like, hey, we've got a lot of interesting behind the scenes stuff we can share about the processes and how we make this stuff possible. And it is just literally a case of sitting down in front of the camera and just talking you through the timeline, talking you through the processes and how we do what we do. And um, yeah, there's stuff that's just been years in the making here, like, you know, our whole PC benchmarking workflow. I mean, Alex came on uh, pretty late on um, and has had to be introduced to this bizarre way of doing things. But um, but fundamentally, this has been going on for at least since 2015, uh, before that even. I think it would be like when the 750 Ti launched is kind of when we first uh, looked at it. But, you know, essentially this whole workflow that enables us to do the context sensitive graphs and to get a much deeper understanding of performance in context, which I think is really important, you know, because a bar chart will never tell you exactly what is causing a performance problem. Whereas if you actually see, you know, a massive explosion on screen and a huge dip to frame rate, you know, you can actually start to understand how games work and what the performance implications are. So that's kind of what we were doing there on the PC side. And it's all sort of explained as I talk through the timeline uh, with regards to uh, the 3080X, no, 3080M. And uh, yeah, that was just a really interesting uh, project, really quick video as well that, you know, but I do think there's something really interesting it's to pretty share pretty much there. the antithesis of what Audie and I have been doing. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's actually <a> and, um, <laughs> getting it done. Yeah, you know, and again, I've just really been enjoying popping into the archive, bringing out a hard drive and um, decompressing 2010 era captures from, you know, pretty much when Digital Foundry was still in its relatively early period and uh, reinterpreting that data. So we've got our classic FPS analysis. I think this week it's going to be Lost Planet 2. Uh, next week, it's going to be Red Dead Redemption. But, you know, I tell you what, I mean, man, we get a lot of heat for pointing out differences between consoles where it's, you know, it's basically a technical curiosity, you know, small frame rate drop here or there, slight resolution drop here or there. Revisiting all this data, I mean, 2010, I'm, I'm looking at the hard drives there. You know, PlayStation 3 was three years old by this point, but man, the multiplats were still in a really terrible It was position. a bloodbath on the, the PS <laughs> triple. That thing, uh, I mean, almost across the board, like PS3 versions of games were just almost universally terrible with just a few exceptions. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, that's like the poster that child, but 
But even just like <laughs> anything with Unreal Engine was always going to be worse on PS3. I mean, the only exceptions yeah. were stuff like Final Fantasy 13 and like Burnout Paradise, which is pretty much equal. But by and large, uh, yeah, it was a dark time. I mean, you just look at this was Last Planet 2, right? And it's using a different AA at a lower resolution, I'm pretty sure. And with worse frame rate on the PlayStation 3. Uh, that's brutal. Like if that came, if that happened today, people would be up at arms. John would be, you know, uh, <laughs> be lit, lit on fire on Twitter <clears throat> for for reporting on something like that. But uh, that's just the way it was back then. PS3 was just that that GPU, I really think, and that more exotic uh, CPU architecture was just not good for the way engines were built at that time at all. No, uh, no. But I think on the flip side, it was a kind of teachable moment for Sony, and they came back with PlayStation 4, which is the antithesis of PlayStation 3 in just so many ways. And look what happened, you know, 100, 120 million units sold, and they basically dictated the flow of game development for a generation. That's that's kind of how getting the hardware right is, um, uh, is so crucial. And again, going back to the PS1, as we were talking about earlier, uh, you know, the reason that gained faction is um, because when you've got a really good piece of kit, when you've got a really exciting platform to work on, developers want to work on it and they want to get the best out of it. And um, that is another recipe for, for, you know, for success. It's just, you know, that developer buy-in is just so crucial. Mm -hmm. What's interesting there though, Rich, is that for the PlayStation 1, originally the SDK was a nightmare for the Japan launch. Apparently really? the developers were extremely upset just by how buggy it was. And Sony themselves, you know, rushed the SDK. And then for the, uh, especially European launch, but the US launch as well, a Cygnosis mm -hmm. stepped in. Or With SN like, SN SN Cygnosis systems. and another developer SN in the UK. Systems, yeah. Yeah. Uh, stepped in to fix the SDK for Sony. Well, they they, they released their own issues. dev kit that was, or SDK. It was like the PsyQ system, something like that. Yeah, which was based on a lot of the yeah. So they because they targeted all the bugs that kind of they found in the original SDK, mm. and there was a ton. It was like literally wasn't using the hardware to its potential at all. Wow. So you had like to force anything out of it with the Japan launch, which I think kind of explains some of the games. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. Well, you know, I just remember back in the day that um, all of the buzz behind the scenes was for PS1 and um, there was a huge amount of negativity towards the Saturn from the, you know, the developers I was speaking to. And um, it was a really difficult system to work for. And um, maybe it's simply because by the time European developers got to get hands on with the kit, which more US developers actually, maybe mm -hmm. things had moved on by that point. But yeah, really interesting, really interesting stuff. What's next on the uh, content here? Core i5. Yeah, Ooh, I just yeah. want to get a quick awesome. shout out for- What um, kind of note is that? Well, <laughs> <That's> awesome. you <laughs> know, <laughs> it is awesome. I'll tell you what, look, here's the situation. We're in a, in a sort of um, uh, environment where you can't really upgrade your PC with cost efficient parts uh, that actually give a good relative uh, price versus performance. So, you know, we live in a world where a 3080 costs two and a half thousand dollars and where a 3060 can be like over a thousand dollars and you can't buy them anyway. <laughs> um, so the Core i5 11400F costs about 150 pounds, 175 dollars. And at best, at best, the CPU that costs 530, 540 dollars is 25 percent faster. So, and the, with the uh, with the i5, you can buy it. You can buy it at MSRP. Nobody's trying to you know sell you this at two or three times retail cost. And um, obviously, Intel had a really rocky time with the Rocket Late launch. It was basically a piece of silicon that was pushed to its limits. It was hot. It was power hungry. Um, this is kind of like something different. It's the model of efficiency. It's not trying to eke out every last frame of performance. Um, you can limit it to 65 watts and run it with a stock cooler and it runs absolutely fine. And it's just a really nice bit of kit. And, you know, we kind of need this win in the PC space. We need something that's, you know, going to get you excited uh, in a world where, you know, there is some really fantastic hardware out there at the moment, but it's simply almost impossible to buy one. 
So, you know, it's the CPU isn't the sort of obvious upgrade vector. And obviously there are still the limitations with this platform. Um, you can't go above eight cores, but you know, you don't really need to for gaming. So, you know, this is just a really nice gaming platform. And I really was amazed at the data that came back. And it also shows that things are changing for Intel because um, they've unlocked memory uh, support on mid-range platforms. They've even unlocked uh, power um, limitations, um, but that doesn't really seem to make much of a difference for gaming um, on this. So, you know, this is just a really nice part, a really good piece of silicon. Don't need high-end cooling, don't need high-end board. And in most scenarios, when you're pairing it, you know, when you get the right balance between CPU and GPU, it runs exactly the same as a $540 CPU. So yeah, I just wanted to get a shout out in there. I've really enjoyed looking at that. And um, we kind of need more of these wins. Just a quick question for me would be, um, I haven't looked at the results yet, <clears throat> but um, do you see this as a mainstay GPU that, a uh, CPU that you could use throughout this entire console generation probably based upon its specs and uh, um, how it's performing possibly. right now? Um, yes, I do think so. Um, but you do have mm. the upgrade path available to eight cores and higher clocks if you need it. I think that's the bottom line. Uh, but it is running Cyberpunk uh, with a ray tracing, you know, 50s to 60 frames per second, which is pretty good. That's it. And um, uh, I guess the other thing, which I think is really interesting, is that AMD doesn't have an answer to this because they upped the prices for the Ryzen 5000 series. You, you did get awesome performance, but they kind of left the mid-range behind. So before the i5, there was the Ryzen 5 3600, which mm -hmm. is a really nice chip. But you know this i5 is outperforming it between 20 to 40%, uh, which is, you know, AMD really needs to bring Ryzen 5000 into the mainstream. But I guess one of the strangest things I've heard in a long time, just to think yeah. about that AMD leaving the mid-range behind and Intel going for it. It just feels yeah. like uh, times have changed. <laughs> it's astonishing. Yeah. But, you know, we're talking about $175 GPU producing good performance, and this is amazing. But that was kind of how things were back in the day. You know, you'd buy your i5 for like, you know, $175.00. Your i7, which you didn't really need for gaming back in the day, um, that was like 250, 275. So it's kind of like almost like a going back to the way things were. But now, it's certainly in the current climate, it's a mega bargain. There's lots of exciting stuff coming to the Patreon this week. There's also the Retro Corner, where John and I will be talking about the Metal Gear Amiga port that came out. Uh, it'll be a little bit delayed due to the amount of work on the DF Retro yeah. episode, but it, it is coming. Uh, but uh, let's jump into the Q&A. All right. So Richard Ledbetter's favorite part of the show, the Q&A. Uh, we got some uh, pretty nice questions here today. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, let's start here with one from uh, Thibault, I guess it is. Tybalt? <laughs> Thibault. I have a it's slight... Thibault, I think. Thibault. It's Thibault? Yeah. Thibault. Right. Thibault. Thibault, like Billy Blanks. Is <laughs> yes, Thibault with Billy Blanks. <laughs> um... I have a slightly technical question, so probably for Alex, probably. Uh, you're often talking about forward and deferred rendering in videos, but I don't think you ever really explain what that really means. Could you explain what the difference is between the two ways of rendering and what are the main benefits drawbacks of using one or the other? This is a really long answer, so I really actually can't give it. Oh, it's, 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 it's pretty long, um, but I mean, I, I'll just give a really quick overview, just like the really, really quick one is that forward rendering and I'm going to talk about forward lighting and shading. Uh, was the way graphics were done for a really long time, basically up until right around the Xbox 360 PS3 generation, where uh, you uh, do your geometry and lighting kind of one right after the another immediately. And based upon the amount of triangles that were in visible in-screen space, uh, each light would have to kind of like be calculated off of it. It would be like a multiplicative effect. The more lights you had uh, and the more triangles in screen space, uh, uh, you would have a much more expensive calculation with forward rendering. And that would also include triangles that were not necessarily visible to the viewer. Uh, they could be behind another triangle, but they would still have to be shaded given their lighting. Uh, deferred shading says, yeah, we're going to put all the geometry on screen, uh, but we're going to shuffle out uh, extra buffers like uh, normals, color, and depth, 
And then uh, as those are thrown out later on, based upon your screen resolution at the end, lighting is calculated as a post-process effect. So you're not actually reshading for every single light source, and you're not shading necessarily uh, fragments, uh, um, uh, how you would call them, uh, vertices and uh, uh, pits of geometry that are behind other geometry. Uh, the, the, the core reason why that's awesome is because you're decoupling uh, lighting complexity from geometry complexity, uh, so you can have tons more lights in the scene, uh, unlike earlier. Uh, but you're increasing as a result of having all these extra buffers, the amount of bandwidth that's required to do it. And also shadowed lights are not included at all because the way shadowing is done in uh, traditional rasterized rendering. Uh, so you're still going to be paying pretty uh, much a lot for shadowing. And as a result of the fact that lighting is now done in a supposed process, um, uh, you're not getting the effects of multi-sample anti-aliasing anymore as a part of uh, as a part of that, uh, because it would be applying to a step before lighting is done, and you wouldn't be seeing it at all. That's that's kind of about it. Uh, it could be done probably in a better way. I probably should have said it at one point in some video, uh, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess to well, that was a short modern point. modern techniques today sort of combine elements of this, and there's yeah, yeah. there's a lot of things in between now. It's not usually just completely yeah. deferred or completely I forward. But I, like I was describing deferred shading, there's deferred lighting, there's the yeah, it, clustered forward, clustered, clustered forward, yeah, all clustered this stuff, deferred, all these things. You know, it's so it's talking about he's talking about the main benefits and drawbacks, and the main benefit of deferred really is just the sheer amount of light sources you can get on screen. This is what uh, yeah. Killzone 2 did, and when deferred rendering was still relatively new, I guess. Yeah. It was one of the earlier games, I feel like, that... Yeah. that no, I mean, I guess, wasn't there like a Shrek game on Xbox that was There's deferred? The Shrek, yeah. It's Shrek on Xbox, but also Perfect Dark Zero's uh, deferred as that well. That came out later, People always though, forget Shrek. that. But yeah, Perfect yeah, Dark came Zero, out later, that's yeah. right. It that's is. 2005, so it's like but, a little bit earlier. That was the secret behind being able to put so many lights on screen at a time. So, And that's what uh, happened when... Actually, deferred was kind of a bad move for MT framework performance on consoles. All the M original MT framework games were forward rendered, and then they moved to deferred with like Lost Planet 2, Resident Evil 6, and all that. And they all ran horribly, especially on PS3. So actually, there's, the, there's this question from Luke here. He's talking about um, he's not really into all of these specific abbreviations and graphics effects, uh, and, he wants, and he thinks he's not alone. Have you ever thought about making... Um, <laughs> I like the way he's putting back it. Short. Have you ever thought about making short explanation videos for amateurs like me? Or maybe some captions. And he ends with the classic, if not, why not? Rich, I think I think the big secret here is, you know, for like informational stuff, I don't know what you guys think, but I actually don't think videos are good as like a handy lookup. Uh, because you, when you want to discover information quickly, cause you don't understand something, you don't want to scrub through a video, which is why, you know, just the idea of like having maybe like a landing page, even something we could like link into the videos where we kind of like have explanations for a lot of common techniques kind of spelled out on there. And maybe with some like screenshot examples or something like that. And if you want more, there's always a tech focus short explanation or captions of me editing this show i wouldn't want to do captions for example, <laughs> no. every time alex <laughs> talks about different techniques because it goes fast and loose so it would just be like a never-ending uh, edit <laughs> of uh, things popping up with rich's head on it <laughs> but uh i think one thing that could be done here because you have tech focus which is you know a deep dive but you could do like a 101 type thing where you just kind of shortly go through the abbreviations and just the techniques so people can kind of learn what <sighs> It, it lacks utility for a certain degree uh, because the only problem is um, this happens all the time because there's actually, if you go through all of my videos, there's usually all of these, these phrases are described at one point in some video in a certain amount of time. Uh, and it's, uh, I do end up re-saying re a lot of descriptions over and over again. It actually does sometimes pain me a little bit because I feel like I'm, I'm wasting a lot of time explaining things uh, instead of getting to the point. Like every if every single time I had to explain ray trace reflections, I also had to describe what screen space reflections are um, just because people need to know the difference. Like they don't intuitively know that. Then I, I'm spending like two minutes already doing that. And it's really hard. A one-on-one video idea uh, probably, 
uh, partially that's uh, like this current tech focus that I'm working on that right now with like without any breathing breaks in it. It's like 30 minutes long. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and it's explaining uh, global illumination. And I am going through all of the pre-ray tracing, well, not all of them, all of the primary uh, pre-ray tracing versions of how global illumination was done. And as part of this, I'm explaining them in a pretty high level, but easily understandable uh, way. Uh, I think over time, the next one I'm gonna be working on, I'm not sure what it's gonna be about, uh, at the moment, but as a part of these newer tech focuses that I'm going to be working on, I'm going to be describing in pretty simple terms what a lot of abbreviations are that I use. So I don't think it'll take the form of a 101 video because uh, there's uh, there's like a billion uh, different abbreviations I could try and even talk about, and I don't know where to start necessarily. Can I always. just interject, Alex? Yeah. That, you know, you've done some great work recently. Feel free to take a breathing break. <laughs> do, some, do, do some breathing. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's fully endorsed at management level. Like uh, I'm all about that breathing, but the, the video will have I swear it'll have some breaths in it uh, in a couple of moments. But uh, yeah, get, just really quickly getting back to it, I, I'm gonna really uh, I'm gonna as a part of these newer tech focus videos, and they'll come out in a certain amount of time. I can't say exactly when. They will describe some of these basic basic burning things that you really want to know about. Uh, but for some of them. I think John's got it right where uh, I'll say the word like screen space and occlusion, and then I'll maybe start calling it SSAO. And if you're not sure, I think there's so many good resources online just to Google Wikipedia pages, for example. Maybe even we could like somehow compile some of these better sources. Like if you want more information, go read these things and like have like a place. So I feel like that's a uh, pin the discord link. Or like something. this, this feels yeah. like something that would help a lot of people is just having like easy access to like a place they can go and say, Oh, what's this thing do? It's like a glossary almost. And then we could either write a little description and then have like links to other resources, just something to help people kind of get an idea of what this is without having to build content specifically around it, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I work here and I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> See, you could be come anything you want to be in life. Just ask yes. Audi. <laughs> Maybe we should just send out like physical flashcards to our Patreon supporters with every. With yeah, every, right. Every Three by five uh, inch ones. All yeah. I can say is that everybody should have a dream, Audi, and you being able to understand what we're saying. It would mm -hmm. be just the stuff of. What can I say? <laughs> It's the mountain of aspiration. I'm trying my best, but I just F wall short all over the time. Yeah. <laughs> so next question comes from Ryan Harvey. Hey, DF. Do you guys have any thoughts on covering Final Fantasy XIV? The game has expanded onto third generation of consoles since it came out on the PS3 to PS5. The game has come a very long way, and it should be somewhat accessible to cover due to the free trial. Would love the DF team to look at the new PS5 version that released just yesterday as of this recording, I suppose. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV. Um... The only thought I had on that is we could, is like finding somebody, uh, like I thought, like what if we asked uh, Mark Triforce Duddleson from My Life in Gaming to look at it? Because he has played so much Final Fantasy XIV and is intimately familiar with every facet of the game on every platform. Somebody like that could do it justice, but I think none of us have the time or desire to learn about it and anything we might do on it, you know, it would be pretty clear that we don't really know the game that well, which would probably just annoy anybody that's interested in watching a video about it. <laughs> so it's, that's uh, the thing. It's yeah, probably not worth it. Actually, well, you know, <laughs> to addressing Ryan's question directly, uh, do you do you have any thoughts on covering uh, Final Fantasy fourteen? I can honestly say that until I saw this question, I had no thoughts whatsoever. <laughs> I'll break their hearts. Uh, I'm, better. I'm sorry, but Ryan. I'll tell you like what, high um, school all over again. Uh, <laughs> I do like the idea of getting somebody who actually has played it to, to, to talk about it, because I do think there is a story here. Because um, we, you know, we did talk about this game when it was... Um, uh, when it first came out, we did actually cover it. I know that back in the day, it was really difficult to do like comparisons and whatnot, simply because of the dynamic nature of the game. But, um, you know, we're not just really about comparisons anymore. And maybe there is a bigger story to, to talk about here. 
example, one of the interesting stories about MMOs that have been around for a long time, and unfortunately there's not much you can do about this, is that they've actually changed graphically and visually and performance-wise in say like to intense degrees, like World of Warcraft in its initial form versus World of Warcraft with DirectX 12 ray trace shadows and things like that now. Completely different things. But you don't really always have access to this initial version because it's a live state environment, unfortunately. I know John's shaking his head right now because it's it's it sucks that you don't have access to these things uh, without going the highly illegal Russian server route. Um, so uh, that's the story I think that is actually really interesting here. Um, uh, we, it's possibly more doable since this game is has a PS3 version. Uh, so, uh, but for usually MMOs, this is almost like you can't touch it uh, really without investing a lot of time. I think the video would do well because it, you know I think people are genuinely interested in it, and uh, it is a really good example of a game that's kind of added momentum over the years. They haven't just allowed it to um, you know to kind of wither and die because you know I seem to remember when it launched, it was actually in a pretty perilous state. Oh, yeah. So the fact that they've been able to turn it around and to well, I mean, there's the whole story of they launched Final Fantasy XIV. It was terrible. And they rebuilt the entire game and launched it as a Realm Reborn, which was basically a completely different game uh, that was also kind yeah, of Final Fantasy thing. XIV. It's kind so. of, you're talking two different ones there. And yeah, uh, the fan base for F 14 is pretty it's big, passionate. They're very mm. active and, you know, it has its own world. I, mean, I would say, I would even say that, like, compared to something like World of Warcraft, which, you know, hugely popular but the investment the personal investment <laughs> that the final fantasy 14 fans have is just way yeah. more intense and i mean intense in a positive way there mm -hmm. it's just like they really care about each other and they really care about the game yep. and this was uh, even uh i don't know if you guys saw but speaking of 14 uh just uh, i think last week uh oh, yes. one of the composers Oh, yeah, uh, I there was this. a concert the first uh, um, live concert they've been able to hold for like over a year and Sokin, one of the composers, uh, announced live on stage that he had actually been diagnosed with cancer since uh, last year and been in the hospital composing music and uh, almost, um, you know, went through chemotherapy and uh, looked pretty bad at some point. And uh, he announced now that he is actually in almost full remission. Congrats. And uh, it was a pretty powerful moment, uh, which uh, I was contemplating coming on the show last week to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But it just kind of shows you the investment that the fans have because it meant so much to them. And the whole internet had like the uh, hashtag welcome back Sulkin. Uh, didn't they have some kind of like on. vigil or something in the game? Not a vigil, but you know, like a like some sort of like Get thing together. of honor. A gathering yeah, yeah. in one of the big cities or something like that. The whole team uh, is kind of recognizable. I mean, again, it just they've been able to personalize that game very differently from something that, for example, Blizzard would do. It's oh, just yeah. the entire audio team, the graphics team, like they're all personalities. And the players themselves, there's people that people like there's famous people that just play the game. Mm -hmm. It's very strange. Uh, but I think that comes down to just the incredible art direction and, you know, the core gameplay is great as well. So Final Fantasy XIV would be fun to cover. And I think people would enjoy it. But uh, if we don't do it right, uh, we're going to upset people. And I don't want to upset them. Yeah, because exactly. it means a lot to them. And it, sh you know, it should respect. be done right. Exactly. So yeah, maybe someone would like uh, Triforce from My Life in Gaming would be perfect for it. Or maybe someone else. So yeah, MMO MMOs in general are hard to cover just because... The reason people play them are not the same as someone on a console playing Call of Duty or something <laughs> like when you do comparisons or you know, just look at the game. That's not why they're there for it. They're there for like the other players and the unity mm -hmm. and the grouping. Like it's hard to cover such a thing in the technical analysis because it bypasses all that. It's not that important. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I've seen somebody play like an MMO like this on a laptop with a cracked screen at like five fps and they were actually having fun and i was yeah, just like right? they exist on a different plane than i do and i'm fascinated <laughs> by this you talking about all this there. no <laughs> uh, next question will amd's fsr when it arrives be compatible with all their game titles or do games have to be built with it as part of the code that comes from somatic uh, games have to be built with it part of the code because it's a very specific form of 
probably temporal anti-aliasing. So it would have to be rebuilt into the game. It couldn't work agnostic of the game. Yeah. Do you think there is actually a route forward in the future for using um, some kind of technique that doesn't actually have to be plumbed into the, the game's uh, technology? Do you think there is some way that we could get an AI upscaler, for example, that could, that could do it in real time? I guess the idea is, uh, so on PC, you already have access through DirectX or Vulkan uh, to all the game's buffers uh, as a post-process through something like RenderDoc or NVIDIA Insight and things like that. And I guess if there was maybe an AI that could parse those and find uh, like one of the internal buffers like motion vectors or something like that and work off of that, Maybe there's something there, but every engine's so different and you need more than just that. You also need like other parts of the post-processing pipeline to be uh, knowing what's going on regarding resolution and internal resolution. So maybe there's some sort of pipe dream example of it, but I don't think so at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm just really interested in seeing uh, AMD's uh, uh, upscaler. Uh, we still know nothing about it. Um, possibly with Computex happening, uh, they might choose to, to show something. I do believe it does actually exist and is actually with developers, but we just have had nothing to go on so far. So it's all down to AMD to talk more about it. Far Cry 5 is being showed off on May 28th, and I know that's the Fidelity FX Six. sponsored title. Six? 26? Far Cry 6, yeah. Far Cry yeah. 6. Oh, well, you know what? There's been so many. Can you really count? Um, yeah. And they're all the same, sorry. Uh, but really, uh, for, yeah, that's gonna be shown off. Two. Yeah, except for one and two. Uh, <laughs> they're all gonna be shown, it's gonna be shown off and um, they're gonna be showing off how they're using like hybrid ray tracing for reflections and probably all these other things. I imagine maybe they could show it off there as well. Now, uh, Alex, just not to upset the previous questions, what does FSR stand for? Uh, Fidelity Effects Super Resolution? I think. All right. Yeah. Right? So right? I mean, well, right. there's FSR. There's, I'm, I'm really, I, I'm not very good with abbreviations. <laughs> I, did, I did sort of uh, chuckle when um, uh, AMD said that it's not uh, FFS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're not calling it FFS. It's FSR. Yeah. FFS, we're not calling it FFS. Uh, Come on, guys. <laughs> Let's uh, jump into one last big question here. It comes from uh, Dubuk oh, this Nathan. Is a good one. I hope I, yeah, I hope I said that right. I don't uh, know. Do you think a DLSS for frame rate would be possible using machine learning to double the frame rate from 30 to 60? I know a non-ML attempt using vectors was made for Star Wars Force Unleashed, but it was dropped from the final release, probably because it of the added input lag from doing this. Could ML help output a cleaner result with less input lag? And by the way, Rich, if you have that demo of Force Unleashed running at 60 frames per second with frame interpolation in your archive, that would be great to see in. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I only have- Good quality. <laughs> I, only, <laughs> I only have the um, MP4s that the developer actually put on the internet. Um, I didn't actually see that. Um, I think the reason it w didn't actually make it to uh, shipping status, there were two reasons. I think there were artifacts with it. And secondly, um, it didn't work with transparencies, which is a bit of a problem when you've got a game with lightsabers in it. Um, so I think that was the issue there. Uh, but DLSS for frame rate. Now, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are some, uh, there, there's some evidence perhaps from NVIDIA, like research, where they've looked into this. Yeah, they, they, they didn't show it directly as the way the, the person here is describing it, but they showed essentially uh, it doing a very similar thing. They had a research example. I'm gonna send this video over to Audi if I can, so we can insert it here, where they were showing an Unreal Engine 4 example of the camera moving through a scene as characters are moving, and it was actually applying deep learned motion blur to them. Uh, so it wasn't using, you know, like the typical motion blur that we see in video games, but a deep learned version of it. And what that is actually doing, motion blur is just interpolating in between real frames and inserting more information. There's nothing stopping them from using that exact same technique and actually having real frames there 
instead of ones that have like a post-process blur on them. Uh, so it could insert fake frames into a real frame, uh, a real frame game. I think there's probably a, a number of ways to do this. And I think uh, one that could be done uh, with DLSS would, where, where, would, would be where DLSS is about reducing uh, typically GPU uh, uh, kind of time and trying to make the game run faster on the GPU. But there's nothing that could be said that, oh, your CPU isn't actually good enough for 60 FPS. So in, a, in this DLSS for frame rate, hypothetical scenario, I'm imagining where they actually run the game simulation at 60, uh, a lot of aspects of the simulation at 60, and then interpolate the graphics using some sort of DLSS-like thing. Uh, so you would get actually proper input latency for the most part, uh, and proper visuals for the most part, but the, the in-between frames would all be done through some sort of interpolated machine learning style, whatever. That's the way I'm imagining it. And then the other one is kind of uh, more dumb and not as interesting, which is kind of a bit like how your television upsamples uh, frame rate, where it's more, it's more of a post process and you would have the exact same input latency, if not even more, probably yeah, even more. Yeah, end up with yeah. more. And so, visible artifacts would certainly arise from it too, so. Yeah, yeah. So I, I do remember, Alex, that you did a tweet about that research, saying it was really interesting research. And then the bloke who did it replied and said, "Yes, that was really interesting research, wasn't it?" I yeah, I forget his name off the top of my head. Yeah, I think that yeah, you know, maybe I'll just I can find it that way easily. Um, but yeah, so I think they are definitely working on things. They finished well. They DLSS two point one is out now, and everyone's pretty happy with it, and it's getting wide integration. They're probably researching other stuff right now that is also as applicable and interesting. Yeah, I guess the, the question is that, you know, if you can get the existing DLSS to the point where you're getting double the performance, it's effectively doing the same thing, right? <laughs> yes, it is quite a, quite a bit, yeah. <laughs> and I think the guy we were talking about here, his name was Brian Catanzaro. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, popped into Twitter there to have a look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes the show for today, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, interesting stuff. We'll definitely, uh, we keep talking about doing a Patreon exclusive like a mailbag catch up. And uh, now that John and I are done with DDF Retro soon, uh, we'll definitely go back and look into that and answer some of your unanswered questions from the weeks that have gone past and then uh, get some Patreon action going there. But uh, for today, thank you so much, all of you, for joining me. It was a lot of fun. If you enjoyed this video, ring the notification bells, follow us on Twitter and on YouTube, subscribe us to us there. Of course, join us on the DF Supporter Program on Patreon, where you can join our Discord. We're there every day. If you ask Rich nicely, I'm sure he'll turn his camera on <laughs> all day long. And, uh, yeah, I'll have my Dungeon View camera ready for, for your inevitable return. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll get back into the shackles, sir. <laughs> But, of course, we'll be back next week with more DF Direct Weekly. But until then, see you later, and goodbye.